All right. I think we're going to have an amazing conversation today. We have Ethan Howard, and this is our inaugural kind of phantom food series where we really highlight the people in the industry, you know, the ones that have been working hard, the ones who have created, you know, a, a, an experience that has allowed them to grow. Uh, and they have a breadth of knowledge of what's happening, where they think the, the future of the business is going. And to be honest, just very good conversation. So I'd like to welcome Ethan. Uh, Ethan, hey, thank, why don't you- give, Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for being on. Why, why don't you give us a, a quick intro on who you are, you know, give us a, a full resume background, because that's the one thing I really like to emphasize is, you know, where have you been? What have you done? Where are you going? I think it's really important for the audience to hear that. Absolutely. Uh, again, my name is Ethan. I uh, am a pastry chef at Alilia Napa Valley uh, at the, the Acacia House Restaurant. Um, to go way back, I mean, we all we all start with a passion in cooking, and and that was built through my family, uh, through holiday dinners, brunches, breakfasts, and I just re it really stuck with me, and I wanted to kind of grow and learn a little bit more. Um, I, I went to college. I went to the Claremont Schools in L.A., Pomona. And then after college, I really wanted to pursue cooking and culinary a little bit. So I started where, you know, everybody starts in a pizza shop or a Shake Shack or something. So I started in a brewery, uh, worked my way up in, in the brewery slash restaurant. Um, and then th kind of worked the grill, worked savory side, worked pizzas. And the chef knew that I was interested in, in things and said, if you really want to go somewhere, if you really want to learn, I, I know of a restaurant in San Francisco. I worked with that chef and that chef was Chef Hubert Keller of Florida Lee. Um, so, you know, you, 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 you write letters because uh, email back then <laughs> wasn't really, a th not everybody had email back yeah. then. Yeah. Um, and you keep going the old school route. You you show up at the at the kitchen door. You knock on the door. You hand him his resume. And you say, "I'd love to work for you." And well, not right now. I'd love to work for you. Well, not right now. And then one day I showed up, and he says, "You know, I I have an opening. Can you start tomorrow?" And and that's how I got in that kitchen and worked for about two years under his guidance. Uh, worked in the savory aspect, saucier, um, worked garmage. Um, just learn really, I mean, you're learning techniques, but you're learning how to work and uh, thrive in a kitchen and especially a high caliber kitchen. So you, you um, kind of knew, you kind of knew where you wanted to go, right? That perseverance allowed you to, to keep following up. How long I think when you're that, I think when you're that young and I, I speak for myself, I was very naive. I, you have a determination and you want to learn. I never had a pinpoint of, I want to reach this point. I just wanted to keep going up. And I didn't really know what up was at that point. I just wanted to see things that I've never seen before and learn techniques that, that, you know, you can see in books, but when you see somebody and you're working with the chef one-on-one -on -one creating a foie gras terrine or creating some sort of a dish for a high clientele in the private dining room, that's something that you want to experience and you want to learn it for yourself. Um, so it was, it was through, uh, chef Keller, who is, I think is also a, you don't call me on this, but a trained pastry chef and he did his own pastries. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just started to gravitate towards pastry. I just seemed to really enjoy, um, how different, uh, it was compared to, um, saute or, or savory, um, how m more precise it is, how you just can't, you know, what's the, what's what we pastry chefs say, I wish I could just throw a pan on, a, on a fire and then just kind of saute <laughs> and I'm done. I mean, yeah. it, it doesn't really work like that. Um, and again, he said, Hey, I know somebody in New York city, he's opening a new patisserie. Let me check it out and I'll refer you. Um, so I waited, he came back and said, you need to fly out immediately and work for chef, uh, Francois Payard at Payard Patisserie and Bistro. Um, so I went out to New York, packed everything I had. And I mean, it, it's all. I guess what I'm getting at is it's all connection for me. It was all referrals and mentors and people that were, I was very lucky enough to have guide me in a way of, of growing my, my experiences. Um, so I worked under Chef Francois for about a year and a half, um, learning all the basics of pastry because how he divided his kitchen was, was immaculate. It was, it was cake station and then tarts chocolate, laminated doughs, 
Um, then you had, of course, so the, you know, ice creams, glaces, um, and you would just take different amounts of time in each station and try to build your experience and, and work with the team leader and work with Chef Francois and, and, you know, start creating these creations every single day, every single day. Um, and it was just, it was a great, great experience. Uh, and like I said, I was there for about a year and a half and then I had to come back home for personal reasons. And I landed a, a job at the French Laundry and I worked at the French Laundry under Chef uh, mm -hmm. Stephen Durfee and also under Chef Sebastian Roquel and uh, worked there for about two years and learning, fine I guess you would say the finesse aspect of fine dining, how to really compose a dish, how everybody comes together and collaborates and creates something that I think personally one person would, would be very difficult to achieve that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, I worked there for about two years and then I just started on my own after that and and joined a, a chef at Martini House, Chef Todd Humphreys, and then just kept, I mean, it was just a, always, a kept, I just kept trying to grow and grow and, and take the next step. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just very lucky in doing so. Yeah. Uh, I worked with Chef Todd Humphreys for about four years at Martini House, um, developed, uh, that was my first solo gig. That was my first time, you know, oh, I'm in charge. Oh my God, you know, I have a staff, I gotta be responsible and, you know, <laughs> so. Uh, worked there and, and developed menus, um, catering menus, uh, all, all the and just responsibility building, learning how to manage. Right? I mean, it's it's they don't really teach you honestly that that much. I mean, you get you get a lot, but when you're in the thick of it and you're just trying to produce every day, um, learning how to manage. There's no management quote school, so mm -hmm. I, I was kind of like on the job type of of experiencing how to do that. Um, then I went I returned uh, uh, to Chef Keller and helped uh, build Houchon Bakery, um, open per se, uh, not per se, excuse me, I helped with per se and the Bouchon Bakery in New York, um, ad hoc that when opened up in Yachtville. Um, and it just kind of like try to help get that off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, that's when I went to uh, uh, Cavallo Point. Uh, I was a friend of mine that said, hey, we're opening this hotel in South Salido at Fort Baker. Do you want to be a part of this? You know, it'd be a great experience. And because I've never opened a hotel. And at that point, I've never actually worked in a hotel. So I thought, mm -hmm. well, this is something that would be extremely different. And was there for about 10, 10 11 years, uh, minus COVID. So, wow. yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, that I, was an experience in its own, of its own, right? Banquets, weddings, um, just really trying to maintain uh, different aspects of a hotel pastry department of, mm -hmm. of Minuity slash banquet slash plate of dessert, breakfast, laminated doughs. I mean, that's just it's just a jungle juggling act to, yeah. to try to, to survive, but also to try to thrive and create a name for yourself and create a name for the department. Well, um, it, well and, it seems it seems like you kind of been everywhere, right? <laughs> that, that's I like mean, it, it, you know, it, it's I was very lucky, and I just wanted to try to a, anything that would present itself to me, especially mm. a growing opportunity, and just try to, to, you know, grab hold of that and try to grow and, and take advantage of it. So yep. absolutely. So, so you've been a lot of places. What would you say is the one experience you had, or let's say stint where you gained the, or what was your favorite, I guess is the question. Oh man. I mean, it's, it's like you're, you're choosing a child. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, Every experience was different, meaning everything was, uh, I, I mentioned the French Laundry was finesse and we, we, you know, we know how to make uh, a terrine, but we're going to show you how to elevate that terrine to something that you didn't think you could achieve before. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Payard was, that was the foundation of basic French technique in pastry, learning how to laminate learning how to work with the dough or learning how to temper chocolate and create bonbon um, and create also, you know, the cakes and the uh, entremets and, st and stuff like that. So I, it, every, everything was a little bit different. Um, I absolutely adored New York um, because I'm from the Bay area. Mm -hmm. um, but I would have to say one of my, my favorite times was with chef um, at Florida Lee. 
uh, Chef Hubert Keller. I think that was my inaugural uh, episode of how of getting into a kitchen and learning um, how to work and learning how to be, you know, create in a kitchen. And it's, it was just an experience that I, I, I always think about. Um, so when, when you think about what do you think about most, it's always like that time in a kitchen. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it sounds like, you know, th there's a few people that I've talked to that have started the culinary school route, right? So they wanted to get their experience kind of getting into it. From what I understand, you didn't, you didn't take that route. Is that correct? That's correct. It's funny because, and that, that, the, no shame. That was on me. I mean, I, I, we'll, we'll be honest here. I spent a lot of money at college mm -hmm. uh, and there wasn't a lot left in the piggy bank. Yeah. And so I, um, I just was like, well, I don't know if I wanted to, to, to spend that type of money again. And I honestly have to say that I had the, a chef at the brewery that I worked with, uh, chef Jim Stump, um, who actually came to me and I'll remember this. It was a conversation and a walk-in and for all of you out there, the, the conversations and walk-ins are the ones that really stick with you. I mean, those are the uh, ones that you really yeah. remember. And he said, look, don't, don't go to school. You don't, you don't really, school is good for some things. Um, go and work, go and go out in the field. You're young, go and do experience different um, kitchens. Uh, you won't end up owing anything. You're not going to make a lot, but you're not going to, owe anything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this, your desire and your hunger to learn and to build yourself is what will keep you going. And I just remember that uh, advice. Yeah. I, I don't think that's bad advice at all. I think it's right. applicable today more than ever in yeah. any field that you choose to go in. Um, yes. So that's, that's, you know, I, I definitely think, you know, grabbing your experience, you know, jumping from one place to another, even though you're, you're taking a stint for a decade in some places, right, um, mm -hmm. allows you to really see what's out there and allows you to kind of grow in that, in that situation. So yeah. I think it's amazing where you've started, you know, starting at a, a brewery, making pizzas to where you are now. That just really shows you the potential of sticking with one thing, but also being very diverse in the way that you approach opportunities, right? Yeah. If, if there's an opportunity, take it, I guess is, is what I'm hearing. Yes. And you know, I'm not a, a firm believer in luck, but I mean, there's a case to be said that the people that I worked with and my mentors, I mean, I was very lucky. I was very lucky to have people that wanted to see me succeed. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that if you put in enough effort. If you give, we always say give blood. I mean, if you really work hard for someone else, they in turn will help you go to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 when I look at my peers around me and, and, and hear sto certain stories of how they start, and it, I mean, some of them blow my mind and some of them make me realize how lucky I was to have somebody in a corner, somebody to kind of help me get, keep, keep going up, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. tell you something, something beautiful about this was I, we have another person that we're going to be having a quick podcast with in the future. And her name is Ashley and she works at Dandelion. And I mentioned you uh, <laughs> and, and what was so astonishing about that was she was amazed by that, excited about that. And she goes, Hey, I learned everything from Ethan. <laughs> um, which, is, which is which is really really cool, and it just shows you how small the world is and everything that you're yes. doing. So exactly what you just said is like, hey, you know, you, you you give blood, right? Work work hard. You know, you're gonna learn. You're gonna keep going. It it's gonna build you. It's gonna drive you. Uh, I mean, the, work work hard for the institution for the chef, but work mm -hmm. hard for yourself. Correct. I mean, I, I that's what I. I, so, I sometimes say to people is, you know, why are we even, he why are we here? What, what are we doing? If mm -hmm. we're not getting out of bed and giving all every, every single day, then you're, you're just kind of betraying yourself now. And, and of course, like if, if take Ashley for an example, I mean, she was an amazing part of the team and brought a lot of new ideas and brought a lot of um, her, just basically her stamina of like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. And everybody sees that. And then it makes me go, wow, man, I'm having a bad day. I'm kind of dragging today. Well, I better, I better push because, uh, you know, my, my people that are working around me are pushing. So I'm not going to be the one that's kind of like, well, I don't <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I love that. And 
you know, I think again, right. There's, there's a lot of things that transcend, you know, this, you don't have to be in the service industry to take value of what you're saying, right? You know, you don't have to be a pastry chef or an executive chef or a bar director or a bartender. Uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to the basic attributes and characteristics of what you want to do, it's about working hard, but doing it in a selfish way, right? You know, you work hard for yourself. Yeah. Uh, you know, you will you will grind through something that scares you or makes you a little bit of afra- afraid because it's a way to grow. And right. I, I definitely see that, you know, you went from, you know, Bay Area to New York for a year and a half and you're just like, hey, I'm just going to move and I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. And that led to one opportunity, which grew into another opportunity. And then, you know, you kind of came back and that's yeah. what I love about the story, right? It's It's that you have such a breadth of knowledge when it comes to not only region, but different types of verticals of different cities, different clientele, you know, even kind of the ingredients you might be using might have changed depending on where right. you are. Right. Right. Um, right. And so that's, that's a- extremely good, but you know, let me, let me segue the conversation into, you know, let's, let's talk about the, the industry as a whole. Okay. You know, how, you know, let, let, out of the stuff that you've done, right. When you look at the industry in a general sense, not just from your experience, what are the things that you like? And then we'll kind of talk about the things that you you are you, you dislike today or would want to change. I mean, going with the positive first. Mm-hmm. Um, first and foremost, it's always collaborating with people. It's the people that you work with. Um, it's it's having one goal, one shared goal, and throughout the entire, we'll just say, restaurant, um, and having a mutual respect be- with between. It doesn't matter wait staff, bus busser barista um and then the back the sous chefs the chef the dishwasher the prep cook everybody has one goal and that's to do the very best that they can do each day and working with those people and trying to attain that is really one of the most uh, gratifying experiences that i can have i mean there are some days don't get me wrong that are just whoa that was a really bad day but there are some days when everybody is clicking Everybody is working, it seems like in almost like a like a crew when everybody is just kind of pulling their oars all in unison um, and, and you, you know, win the race or you win the day. That's really what I why I get out of bed and why what, what I go back to every day. And that's really what drives one of the reasons what drives me as well. So that's one of the positives. Um, just just I mean, the, the sheer. Um, joy in creating, right? This, it, this is, I do ag- uh, agree with some people, this is a quote unquote, an art form. This mm-hmm. is creating something. This is putting yourself in a dish or a menu or, or, or something, you know, some, some composed um, plate um, and putting yourself out there and just saying, hey, this is what I'm thinking this season or this menu. This is what I want to share with you. Um, and to be able to do that and, and, and to be able to have somebody try something that you, that you spent a lot of time on that you gave yourself for, um, that's a big, that's a big deal. And that, that, I mean, yeah, I mean, it can backfire. We, <laughs> you yeah. know, it, it, it's, it's tough, mm-hmm. but to put yourself out there to, to be able to, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of not just give, I'm going to tweak this a little bit so that it's going to be a great dish, but it's going to, you're going to see me in it. And that, mm-hmm. that's, that's, you know, what I really, really yeah. enjoy doing. I, I, um, I the love the, aspect. I love the connection to art. Um, yeah. You know, I, I look at, and again, I'm, I'm new to this industry in the sense of, I never have, you know, been in it, right. I haven't worked a job in that industry, but when I'm looking at it as an observer in I yeah. almost look at it as a symphony, right? It's like you've got strings, you've got, you know, your your bass, you've got, you know, trumpets, whatever it might be. They're all kind of coming together to create this experience that would yeah. be amazing. But each person has to hit their note. Yeah. And that's what's really beautiful about it is is exactly what you said is like, you know, you got to connect with people. You got to make sure you understand that you're driving them, you're motivating them, and you're you're keeping them in line with with kind of what you're thinking but also pushing them to innovate and be a little creative right so it's like putting themselves into the food right you're putting yourself into your pastries um 
and that's that's really really cool um when it when it when you you look at this though i think when you look at when you first ran kind of your own crew what was some of the hardships or the learning processes that you had to kind of go through when it comes to teaching kind of the team and and the reason why i'm kind of transitioning out of we'll talk about the dislikes too but yeah. it's interesting to see like hey that jump right it was when you get that symphony to kind of harmonize it's very beautiful and everyone assumes it as a consumer that, hey, this is what they do. But a lot of work goes into training each individual to make sure that they're at a certain point. So I think what kind of training kind of had to go into getting your team up to your standards? Uh, and that, that'll that be interesting to, to hear. Yeah. You know, I, we always joke, um, or maybe it's always me that jokes, but I said, everybody can make a great pie. Uh-huh. I mean, we're, we're all, no offense to any pie baker out there. I'm just saying that making a great pie is achievable. What's really difficult is making 500 pies at the same level of perfection that you want it to be on a constant basis. Mm -hmm. And that's what is really, I, for me, what I'm, what we're trying to not only get better, but also to maintain your level of, you know, what is acceptable to you. Um, And, and I think that's, that's the challenge of any kitchen, uh, what, because you have a constant, everybody knows you have a constant influx and outflux of, of staff. You wish you could have the same staff for at least like heck six months. You know, I mean, yeah. not only a year, um, but having a core foundation, achieving that core foundation and then maintaining the level of perfection that you want to, to achieve with an influx and an outflux of staff coming in and out. That's, I think, what is really the most challenging, Um, not to mention the outside factors, but we can get into that later. But I mean, (laughs) I mean, with especially with everything that's been going on the last two years. But Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I'm just just trying to always, you know, pushing the envelope, but at least being up to the level that you want to be at. I think Mm -hmm. that's that's the, the challenging. So let's see, you brought up a good point and that's turnover, right? Um, you know, I talk to a lot of our partners in the industry right now, especially with everything that's going on, you know, and the, and the safety and, and, you know, just talking about health and safety, we're seeing a high turnover, um, but a limited kind of resupply of, of talent kind of coming back into the pool. Is that kind of what you're seeing on your end too? I am seeing a an extreme low amount of talent pool coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's not a, that's not a secret. Um, it seems to be um, all over. I mean, even nationwide, I, I'm hearing stories about Asia and Europe um, as well as South America, um, that it, it's really difficult to have staff. Um, and I mean, we could get into those factors that what I think anyway, I mean, everybody has their opinion on why, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is a real, I mean, I haven't been staffed fully to a budget in over three years. I mean, I'm, wow. I'm constantly, it's to the point where we're constantly understaffed and now we're just kind of used to it. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah. Um, so that that is a, a challenging factor that now is just a daily, you know, it's in your daily life of, of maintaining, you know, the, the, like I said, the kitchen and what we need to do. Um, with having a low staff. Um, mm. uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, do, I, I see it ending only if we change a couple of things. Um, but that's that's an industry-wide thing. That's not going to be, you know, a couple of restaurants in, in the city. That's going to be something that needs to happen through the whole industry and also through um, our customer base as well. Mm. I, think, I think the industry needs a little help um, through the understanding of what it really takes to, to, I mean, make a profit in this business uh, yeah. or just to maintain, you know, some, do you maintain a marginal <laughs> level of, 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 uh, profit? So, yeah. What, what, what are those? Let's say we live in a very, uh, you've got the golden wish, right? <laughs> when yeah. it comes to this industry, what are the items that need to change to make this, uh, you, you create some longevity. 
I, you know, it, 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 it's easy for me to say we need to increase the wages of the, the back of the house, the dishwasher, mm. uh, the cook, or, the, or even the front of the house, the, the wait staff. Um, I understand that it, that's easier said than done. It's mm. not, it, this can't be done through a, uh, a small soul owner of a, a, any type of small rest, neighborhood restaurant. Um, I think this is more of a, a collaboration between the, 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 the customer base, maybe even small um, local government, and as well as um, the, the property owner or the business owner. Um, rents are enormous. Mm-hmm. Um, the cost of operating, the expenses are enormous. Um, so we that having said that, I mean, I think people need to understand that it really is a great deal to get the you know the twelve, thirteen, fourteen dollar taco. But your neighborhood, your favorite taco place, probably won't be in business within two years if they keep charging those prices. Mm-hmm. And I think that people have to understand in order to maintain and to, you know, keep, keep the lights on. Um, we might have to adjust because of, I mean, we're, we're adjusting for rents, um, payroll and all this stuff, but we're not adjusting for all the expenses it takes to keep those lights on. Correct. Um, and that's going to come out of, I honestly think the customer, mm-hmm. um, unless we get some sort of government, subsidy or something like that local or whatever um and that's something that can be talked about as well so Mm. yeah it it just it sounds like this squeeze is occurring right now right you know it's you know and 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 something's got to give and we don't know what that is yet so we'll we'll see how that goes but i'm kind of in agreement right is there a way to where you know restaurants can generate either additional revenue or more revenue at a at a a margin that can be spread through their staff to keep them for a longer tenure so that, you know, the, you know, the burnout factor isn't there. Right. It's not, that's something we're not even talking about, right. You're, you're running uh, probably a crew right now understaffed, which you, you stated and you, you're kind of used to it, but I think that's, you know, just you saying, Hey, this is how I run now at 120%. That's my new normal. (laughs) That's why I think, yeah, it's, it's funny. I mean, I was telling somebody the other day, I think I think everybody is correct. Everybody mm-hmm. uh, from the, the cook who's not making enough. I, you know, I, I live, you know, the cook could say I live 30 miles away because I have to, I can't afford the housing that's neck in the neighborhood of the restaurant. So I have to commute here. Mm-hmm. Um, I need a little bit more pay or I need a better health care. Do you offer health care? I agree with the owner of the small restaurant. I can't afford this. I can't I can't give. Correct. The, the, my workers what they need in order to keep working here because I it, it would it would drive us under underwater. Um, I, I understand the customer base saying this is too expensive. You know this is uh, why would I come here when I could go to a chain restaurant um, and pay half as much or a third as much or something like that. So mm-hmm. it it everybody has a point. I just think that we all need to come together and stop talking at each other. Yeah. Um, and start and, and start paying attention because sooner or later, these places will be gone and, th- and they probably won't come back because mm. if, if rents keep going up, yeah. I mean, what's what's the point in um, once you fell on your face and the rent is even higher than when you fell on your face? What, why are we going to try to start it back up again? Correct. Yeah. My, my biggest worry here and what we talked about is you have increased rents. Uh, you've got increased, you know, expenses, you've got a talent pool that is shrinking. Um, so the squeeze that is happening on a lot of beautiful, unique boutique restaurants, uh, is, is happening, you know, real time. And that's the, the worrisome, you know, the ones that have survived over the past two years are, you know, congratulations, but you know, there is really, you know, the gloves are still on, let's say that. Right. And, and right. You, know, you gotta, you gotta keep fighting right now. So there's no guarantee for tomorrow. And I think right now is we need to understand and, and I'll have the same question with a lot of folks is understand what we can do collectively to make sure that, you know, your favorite restaurant's still there. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, because I think it, it, it's a, it's a part of it's experiences. It's a part of your, especially for, for growing up. I mean, I remember my favorite bakery growing up. It was a mom and pop place. I remember 
the pizzeria we go to as family night every Friday or something like that. And so these things do matter in people's lives. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this is you know it's not just sustenance to keep going. These are something that are integrated in the community in the neighborhood um, that do that do matter. And and we have to try our best to listen to each other and try to figure this out before like before they just all start to disappear one by one. Yeah. Well, Ethan, I know we, we talked about it, some amazing stuff. Um, to be honest, I really do appreciate the time that you've taken to come on here and, and talk and about I, it. I, I appreciate, yeah. you know, I appreciate being asked. This is great. Yeah. No. And, and I, I love the conversation. I want people to come, you know, eat and, and try your pastries. Tell us where we need to go. How do we connect with you? Okay. Uh, you know, how do we, you know, just make sure that we're, we're pushing enough people to enjoy and experience, you know, the hard work and experiences that you've, you've kind of gone through to, to have the product that you have today. Absolutely. Right now, currently, I'm at the Acacia House restaurant in Napa Valley in St. Helena. Um, that's, that's part, that is in the Alilia Hotel, Napa Valley. Um, and, you know, I've been there about six months and we're just really starting. I mean, they, they started right when COVID subsided in um, February, March, and we're starting to build it back up again. Um, luxury hotel uh, with a lot of, uh, you know, we try to do banquets um, and the, more of a higher end uh, type of, you know, bringing, bringing the, the banquet and the uh, uh, leisure group back. Um, so that's, yeah, that's where I am right now and, and currently enjoying it and trying to build this, um, amenity program, building the banquet program, building the restaurant menu back to where we want it to be. So yeah. amazing. So I'll also connect everybody to harass you on Instagram. Cause that's the best way to, to catch Absolutely. you too. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll definitely, uh, link for our members and for anybody who's interested or in the area to definitely come by and at least say hi. Yeah, a sweet Ethan uh, for Instagram. So yeah, that's where they can find my daily goings. So. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again so much. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Uh, you know, I look forward to potentially having you on again. Maybe we'll have a, a double or triple podcast where we can absolutely. Talk. I, I look forward to it, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ethan. We'll talk yeah. soon. All yeah. right.